thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we have a chat today with uh, Mr. Dallara, uh, who is uh, the chairman of uh, the board for the Partners Group USA and advisory uh, partner. And uh, since we have only 20 minutes for our chat, uh, Mr. Dallara will go directly to it. Uh, you had a huge experience on the handling of the uh, Greek debt during the economic crisis that started with the Lehman Brothers in 2008. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that and how you see the current situation with the, regarding the Greek debt. Well, Demetrius, first let me say what a pleasure it is to be here at the Delphi Economic Forum, my first time at this forum and my first time in Delphi in 50 years. Uh, you know, thinking back to uh, the Greek debt problems, it was a difficult period for Greece. It was a difficult period for much of Europe. Um, as I represented the banks, we did the best we could to try to find a basis for an understanding and for a restructuring of Greek debt, which would provide a window of opportunity for Greece. Uh, the eventual benefits of that huge historic restructuring for Greece have not were not as substantial as I would have wished, in part because of another periods, future periods of political instability, in part because of the design of the adjustment program. Looking back, I, I still am of the view that the program, the economic reform program, which the IMF and the Troika required Greece to follow during that period, was not particularly well designed. It was too much emphatic on continued belt tightening on the fiscal front without the necessary emphasis on structural adjustment. That was 10 years ago. It's been a painful period for Greece during this period. Even as we sit here today, unemployment is still above 10 percent. It's hovering somewhere near 12 percent. Youth unemployment still close to 30 percent. But I am encouraged at what I see today in Greece because I see renewed economic momentum. I see renewed confidence. Just the very fact that I'm here today not to deal with debt restructuring, but to talk about investment. My firm has just invested a billion dollars in equity in a Greek pharmaceutical company. And I've spent a few days this week looking at other investment opportunities. So I see a much more positive outlook for Greece, particularly with the reforms that are underway. You mentioned that you are optimistic about Greece. Uh, you mentioned the difficult times during the period of the crisis. But unfortunately, we have another crisis. Uh, based on your experience, how much you worried about this current crisis with the war in Ukraine? We have uh, international analysis talking about, and even the previous panel was talking about this, uh, inflation in Europe. In, in Greece also, inflation is uh, raised at the highest, at high level. Uh, even in the United States, the inflation is at the highest level in the last 40 years. There is this discussion about uh, raising the interest rates. The Fed already raised one time. They talked about six more times. The next will be 50 base points. Uh, how, how much are you worried that we can face similar difficulties like the previous crisis, even worse difficulties because of this war in Ukraine? Well, I think the war has certainly changed the world in which we live, and most likely in a, in a rather sustained, permanent way. Um, I am concerned about inflation uh, globally, not just here in Greece, but in Europe, in the world. I think that our central banks uh, had to take extraordinary action some years ago, Demetrius, to support uh, the major developed economies during the global financial recession and then again during the, the pandemic. But I believe they've waited too long, to be quite frank, with uh, tightening monetary policy. I believe that in particular in the U.S. they waited too long to withdraw the exceptional support so to the, the bond market. to Mr. Powell is based uh, on uh, well, I think good that, reasons. that now it's going to be necessary for monetary policy to be tightened. And each region, each country must decide its own pace. Um, obviously, it's a concern here in Greece. But Greece is at a 
at a different phase in its economic recovery than most of Europe. It had the strongest year of growth last year than it's had in well over a decade. It has reform momentum. It has investment momentum. Obviously, inflation, particularly in the food and energy sectors, poses a serious challenge. And I think I heard the Prime Minister outline earlier today some ideas about uh, working with Europe or taking national measures to mitigate the adverse effects of some aspects of the energy prices. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that uh, the extraordinary rise in energy prices, along with the broader forces of inflation, are ones that will need to be addressed uh, in order to avoid uh, substantial undue burdens on households and on businesses. Uh, the, the underlying economic strength of Greece, though, is much stronger today, despite the painful decade behind. And I don't really foresee at all a potential that Greece will end up back in the uh, extraordinarily difficult position that it was in a decade ago. Uh, that's good news, uh, because you are a guy with a huge experience on these issues. Uh, let's come to the crisis in Ukraine right now. The, we see extraordinary measures, sanctions to Russia, uh, a type of sanctions that um, are unbelievable for the international economic system we know after World War II. Uh, it's unbelievable, really. Uh, do you foresee any uh, problems on this new era? Because this uh, opens a, a road that it's going to be very difficult for the international economic system. We have the problem with energy. So basically my question is, the medicine towards Russia, is it possible to create problems for all of us, for the international economic system down the road? Well, Demetrius, you're right to raise the concern that these sanctions are going to inevitably have an adverse impact, not just on Russia, but on the world economy. But I firmly believe that these sanctions have been necessary. Uh, they will have an impact. I've had considerable experience in my own career at the U.S. Treasury Department implementing economic sanctions. Uh, they're not my favorite tool because obviously they do have adverse impacts on global efficiency. Um, and on the trading system at large and on the financial system at large. Uh, if not used appropriately, they could also undermine the role of the dollar in global markets over time. But I think that the West has had no choice but to implement these sanctions. We have to monitor the adverse washback on the global economy, and we have to try where needed to mitigate the adverse effect. We probably need to think creatively about adapting the roles of organizations like the IMF and the World Bank and the European Bank <clears throat> in this kind of an environment, because we have vast resources sitting in these organizations that perhaps could be used directly to support. The EU will have to decide how it will mobilize resources, which may have been intended for other purposes, to try to mitigate some of the adverse effects of this. Some of these changes, however, are probably going to help lead us toward a more sustainable energy future. Some of them will probably help lead us globally to a trading and investment system that is not just aligned with economic efficiency, not just aligned with low-cost labor, not just aligned with quality products from abroad, but that's also aligned with our fundamental values and our security. That may cost us a little bit in the long run economically, but democracy is not cheap. Greece knows that. You paid a high price over the years throughout the 1940s to preserve a democracy in your country. I'm afraid that probably recent generations in the U.S. have lost a little bit of a sense of what it takes to preserve and reinforce a democracy. This is probably a time for all citizens and democracies to realize that a bit of sacrifice is going to be called on for all of us. Uh, I want to discuss with you the triangle of U.S., Europe, China uh, on this international economic new era that we are going 
right now because of the crisis in Ukraine and because for many other reasons, starting from 2008, the pandemic, and now this. So uh, how difficult is going to be for these three entities, the United States, Europe, and China, to handle this new environment because they are very interconnected with each other. And uh, we saw the sanctions for Russia. China is watching that. It's legitimate for uh, Beijing to think that, OK, if the US and the West in general thinks that we are doing something wrong down the road, they can treat us with the same medicine. A little bit different, but the concept. Uh, do you think that is going to be a problem when uh, countries like China, like India, like uh, other countries in Asia start thinking about a parallel economic system to the dollar, to the, you know, all these things? Well, we have been working for 70 plus years now to build a globally integrated world economy. We built multilateral organizations which have included China and Russia. India, many economies around the world. And it would be unfortunate, highly unfortunate, if we had to move to a more dual trading and, and, and investment and financial system. In some respects, that's not even practical in my view. But I do think that what we've seen over the last month is a remarkable amount of solidarity, economic, financial, and security solidarity among not just the U.S. and Europe, but among many other countries around the world, those who are not even in Europe and those who are not remotely uh, NATO members. Um, we've shown our cards in the West, and China hasn't yet. Uh, they obviously are watching very carefully. They are so integrated into the global economy and into the global financial system that I think one has to take a hopeful view that they will realize that um, partnering with Russia in light of this barbaric attack uh, is not something that will pay dividends for China in the long run. It's in their hands to make that decision. I think other countries have also to make their own calculus here where they want to be. Um, and in the meantime, I think leading countries in Europe U.S. and elsewhere, we need to continue to show resolve. We haven't always shown resolve, either on the economic or security front, Demetrius. And uh, I, I'm impressed at the resolve we've seen to date, um, and I think it will take more of that, uh, more awareness uh, in the West, uh, perhaps for quite some time, and then we will have to see it. The, the integration of China into the global economy has been so positive for China. The dramatic growth of the Chinese economy in the last 30 years was not just a function of remarkable entrepreneurialism in China, nor cheap labor in China. It was a function of our willingness to maintain broadly open markets. This has led to a remarkable integration in trade, investment, and the supply chain. Disengaging all of that is simply not practical. Uh, we will, though, I think all of us have to think about some elements of not just environmental sustainability and the new phase of trading and investment, but think about security as well. And I think you're going to see that in the West, certain dimensions of these trading and investment relationships will be rethought, reanalyzed going forward. Uh, you may because of China, you mentioned the, that China has to think carefully and disengage from Russia, and it's a decision, a decision by, that Beijing has to make. Uh, you are a seasoned economy, economist. Uh, you know that uh, from now on, because of this crisis and all the crises we faced the last few years, International security, security in general, is going to be economics, based on economics. That's the new thing. It's not only weapons, it's not only traditional diplomacy, but the focus will be the economy and economic relations. Can Europe, and the West in general, not only Europe, but mainly Europe, exclude Russia 
from this new environment because of, of, of what happened? <clears throat> well, I don't see any desire on the part of European or American leadership for a permanent exclusion of Russia from the global economy. Obviously, Russia has a meaningful economy. It plays a crucially important role today in energy supplies globally. It also has special minerals. It's a strong producer of important agricultural products. And I don't think there's any inherent desire to exclude Russia. But I think the message is pretty clear that the direction of this government is not one that the West will accept in the current environment being part of the global economy. Uh, but I think it's important to, to look long term here and not, not think that, that uh, this means that, that the West, U.S. and, and, and NATO or Europe will want to close the door permanently on the Russian economy. I don't think that would, would make sense. I think that that's not my understanding of the objective at all. Right now in Europe, not only in Europe, but again mainly in Europe, unfortunately Europe is at the center of this crisis, all, all, all three crises, starting from 2008, unfortunately Europe was at the core. <laughs> so uh, the societies of uh, European countries, the citizens of European countries are very pressured from 2008 until today. And unfortunately it seems that it's going to be a lot of more pressure to our societies and our citizens. Uh, do you feel uncomfortable or are you worried that this will create social unrest in European countries? For example, in a few hours from now we will have the elections, the first round of presidential elections in, uh, in France. And there is a huge worry that strong possibility that even slightly, Le Pen will be in front on the first round. On the first round. So you understand what I'm saying. Are you worried about that? Well, I am. But I have seen in Europe in the last few years, previous to this crisis, some degree of decline of populism. But we can't at all take for granted that it has uh, disappeared from the landscape. Certainly, we have our fair share of it today in the U.S. Um, I think that my experience in working here in Greece over the years, my experience in working with other European authorities, uh, does suggest to me that it could be an important time with this crisis, with the benefit of the shock of this crisis, for Europe to take stock of its own internal relations. You're absolutely right to say that many citizens of Europe, particularly in Southern Europe, have gone through a tremendous period of duress, strain, loss of hope, uh, loss of employment. Uh, and I think that there need to be not a complete tearing up of the social contract among European countries, but I do think that it's important, and I think Greece could take a leadership position here, um, to make some revisions in the nature of the social contract among European countries. Uh, when I saw firsthand the economic adjustment program designed for Greece, um, I felt like there was a dimension of it that I didn't feel comfortable with. When I was a young officer in the U.S. Treasury many years ago, I worked on many debtor country situations. From the day I walked into the Treasury in 1976, I was thrown into a debtor situation with Mexico. And I remember one of my bosses telling me the first time I went to a meeting, because it was, a, to me, a remarkably constructive meeting between the U.S. Treasury and the Mexican Treasury. And I said, that was a great meeting, and it's almost like we're partners. And he said to me, our job is not to lecture them. Our job is not to moralize with them. Our job is to help them solve a problem because it's not just their problem, it's our problem. I didn't see that attitude always in the European discussions. I saw an element of a punitive element almost. But I think it, we could move past that phase now and translate this into a more dynamic set of, of, uh, of institutions and policies, which I think can, can build cohesion 
Uh, Europe is, is, is one now, and I think we see again there's a tremendous amount of solidarity here in, in this region. Uh, I think we need to let go of old attitudes somewhat in Europe. Um, every country has its own unique culture, its own unique strengths. They're not the same economies, but they're bound together by values and, in the case of many countries, bound together by a common currency. That not only puts obligations on countries like Greece and Italy and Spain, but it puts obligations on every country to try to work and find common solutions. I think we could move into a phase where I could see those, those solutions being found so that the duress and strain that we've seen in many European economies, especially in Southern Europe, can be eased and can be avoided in the future. Unfortunately, Mr. Dallara, our time is up. Uh, thank you for your insights. And let's hope that next year in this marvelous gathering we'll be in a much more hopeful uh, situation. Well, you know, I think I, I share your hope. But before we conclude, Demetrius, I'd just like to make one point, if I would. Um, during the Greek debt negotiations, uh, we found many difficulties, many complications. Uh, I'd like to recognize and pay tribute to one man here to whom Greece and the entire global economy owes a debt of gratitude, and that's Dr. Lucas Papademos, who was my partner in these negotiations. Without, for a period of seven months, he was the most remarkable partner that one could have looked for, and it makes a difference even today. Thank you very much for Thank inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.